Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Fracknoy. I'm the astronomy instructor here at Foothill College in Silicon Valley, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome everyone here in the Smithwick Auditorium and everyone listening to us on the web to this, the 15th year of the Silicon Valley Astronomy Lectures, bringing news of astronomy developments in everyday language to those here in Silicon Valley and those around the world. Uh, tonight, we are very fortunate to have as our speaker, Dr. Mark Showalter. He's, an, he's spoken to us before. You can find his earlier talk on YouTube. But he is an astronomer at the SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, which concerns itself with a lot more than just the search for life elsewhere. They also do quite a bit of planetary astronomy. And Dr. Showalter studies the dynamics of rings and small moons, the miscellaneous objects in the solar system. His early work with data from the Voyager spacecraft led to the discovery of Jupiter's faint outer, what we call the gossamer rings, and Saturn's tiny ring moon, Pan. Starting in 2003, his observations with the Hubble Space Telescope led to the discoveries of Mab and Cupid, two small moons of Uranus, now named after characters from Shakespeare's plays, like so many of Uranus's moons are named. In 2011, Dr. Showalter began a Hubble observing program focused on Pluto, everybody's favorite planet or dwarf planet, depending on your religion, uh, which led to the discovery of two of the five known moons of Pluto. Their names, Kerberos and Styx, were selected through an international naming campaign. So he's a democratic kind of scientist, too. Most recently, he discovered the 14th known moon of Neptune, whose permanent name has yet to be selected. But tonight, we are delighted to have him because he is involved with the New Horizons mission. Those of us who are Pluto fans have been waiting for this for a long, long time. Finally, a spacecraft is going to go by Pluto this summer. And instead of it looking like a tiny dot in our textbooks, it's going to be revealed as a world. Uh, Dr. Showalter is a member of the team for New Horizons, and we've asked him, uh, we've asked him to fill us in on what exactly is going to happen this July when New Horizons encounters Pluto. Here, then, the master of the small objects in the solar system, Dr. Mark Showalter. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Am I on? OK. It's great to be here tonight. Um, thank you to, uh, to Andy for the invitation. Um, before we go any further, um, I just wanted to call your attention to this little nice graphic that NASA put out uh, a couple of weeks ago, 2015, the year of Pluto. Uh, if anybody's sort of anal retentive like me, maybe you'll notice that there's a little flaw in this graphic. I was curious if anybody else caught that. I mean, aside from the fact that there's a doorstep at Pluto, anybody? There's a, OK, if you're at Pluto and then the sun is very, very far away, the shadow across the doormat, those lines ought to be parallel, right? <laughs> so OK, as I said. But we'll grant the artist some artistic license with that and just, just move on. Um, as, as Andy said, I was here, uh, actually it was about six years ago. I also have a role on the Cassini mission to Saturn. And uh, for those of you who don't recall my talk or maybe missed my talk, here's a brief recap. <laughs> um, my point, and, and there is one, is that uh, I'm a rings guy. I have spent my career studying the giant planets, the rings that orbit those planets, and sometimes the small moons, but mostly the rings themselves. Uh, how I ended up getting from there to Pluto is a, uh, is a kind of a long and peculiar sequence of events that I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, before I do that, I thought I should really uh, obey my obligations to my colleagues on the Cassini team, give you a real quick update of what's new at Saturn. When I spoke in 2008, we had been in orbit around Saturn for four years. Now we are in, a, we are in our 11th year of operations, and there are some true wonders to behold in the Saturn system. So very quickly, if you'll indulge me, this actually is not so new. This is what Titan looks like. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. It's uh, enshrouded in a gas cloud, kind of an orange smog. Uh, with the human eye, we can't see through those cloud tops. 
but Cassini has a radar mapper, and every time Cassini has flown by Titan, which is quite a few times now, it has mapped out another strip along the surface of Titan. So we're finally able to lift that veil and see what the surface of Titan looks like. And uh, I gotta say, it's a true wonder to behold. Uh, here are just a couple of pieces of it. Um, Titan has lakes. Titan has islands. Titan has isthmus and uh, bays and all of those things. This is at once a, a very familiar kind of a look, uh, a landscape for us earthlings, uh, but it is also a very alien one. For one thing, those lakes, uh, there's no water in those lakes. They are made of liquid methane and ethane and propane. It rains propane on Titan. Uh, the stuff that you use to grill your hamburgers is the stuff that rains from the sky on Titan. But uh, I just think it's extraordinary to be able to see this world uh, slowly take shape before our eyes. In addition, uh, we already knew when I spoke here last about these plumes, kind of like geysers, on Enceladus. Here we are looking at the dark side of uh, about a 300 kilometer moon called Enceladus. We've actually now flown the spacecraft through those plumes. And when we did that, this is what we saw. We actually got some real close ups. So there are linear cracks in the surface of Enceladus, and these plumes are just sprays of ice coming out from just underneath the surface where that must be liquid water. Uh, when we flew through the cloud, we found not just water, but hydrocarbons, things like methane and ethane, the same things I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, what happens when you mix water with hydrocarbons? Well, you get nothing much, but you could, if you wait long enough, you could get life. Uh, perhaps, and so uh, it's very much an interesting topic for NASA to someday revisit Enceladus and see uh, what might be going on, what's the chemical soup inside that uh, body, and whereas in other places in the solar system you might have to drill down kilometers to get to a subterranean ocean, uh, Enceladus is doing us a favor, it's just squirting that stuff out into space. I'm not saying there are fish in there, but uh, who knows what there is, we really don't know. Uh, sometime around 2011, a very, very large storm formed on Saturn. We've never seen anything like it before or since. Uh, the temperatures in that storm were about 100 degrees warmer than is normal for, for, uh, for Saturn. And uh, that storm lasted for about a year and a half before it finally dissipated. It was an amazing thing to watch. Could be seen from Earth as well. We had an equinox. We had, uh, we had the first day of spring, if you happen to be living on the north side of, of the northern hemisphere of Saturn. When that happened, the sun was shining directly at the equator, which means directly along the ring plane. And that was a great time for us ring scientists to see what was going on vertically, what were the vertical structures in the rings of Saturn. You can see from the shadows here that uh, there are mountains in the rings of Saturn. Now, that's maybe a little bit of an overstatement. They don't last very long, because anything that looks like a mountain here would be a valley if you waited a few hours. These things go up and down. But nevertheless, the fact that we're seeing such a structure in what turns out to be a very highly disturbed part of the rings, uh, I just think it's a remarkable view. And uh, in addition, a little dot appeared. Uh, maybe you can see it, uh, see it right there. It's called Peggy. Peggy is a uh, lump that appeared for no particular reason that we can discern at the outer edge of the rings. It lasted for a year or two, uh, seems to be fading away. At the time it was first seen, we had this idea that maybe we were watching a little moon form and it was going to spin off of the rings and out into orbit around Saturn. That seems not to be the case in retrospect, it's fading away. But still, uh, you know, think about it this way. There's a lot of stirring going on in the rings and if you were stirring cake batter, you expect the lumps to get smaller. You wouldn't expect it if you start stirring cake batter and the lump gets bigger and bigger and bigger. For some reason, even in spite of all the stirring, a lump formed in the rings of Saturn. Uh, we just don't know why that happened. So, uh, now I will move on outward to the more distant fringes of the solar system. This is an image of Pluto. Uh, it was taken uh, in 2006 by some of my colleagues on the New Horizons team. Uh, it's particularly interesting, I think you will note, for a couple of reasons, namely Nix and Hydra. Uh, what we're doing is we're staring at the system. We've overexposed Pluto and Charon by quite a bit, so we get a lot of glare and a lot of mess in the middle of that image. But off to the right, I think it's pretty obvious that there are two extra dots there. That was the discovery of the little moons called Nix and Hydra. And this was about the point where it suddenly caught my attention. You know, hey, maybe Pluto's kind of interesting too. It's got some more moons anyway. And uh, I was not the only one, but I was among the people who started to say, you know, maybe Pluto has rings. 
Now that is not a totally crazy idea as it might sound. The reason is that uh, in other places in the solar system when we see tiny moons, we often see rings associated with them. Dust comes off of a tiny moon called Anthe, which orbits Saturn in this Cassini image, and spreads out to form a slender ring that goes all the way around the planet. So there's a, a, the ring from Anthe. Uh, I showed you already Enceladus, it's got plumes, so we know stuff is coming off of Enceladus, but there you can see that it spreads out and makes this kind of fat, messy ring, which also goes around Saturn. Here's another image. This was work I did uh, in the discovery of the uh, moons of Uranus in the process of discovering MAB. Whoops, sorry about that. In the process of discovering MAB, uh, let's go forward, sorry. Okay. Uh, there we go. In the process of discovering MAB, uh, 2003, a few years later when we had been doing a lot more imaging of the Uranus system, we found there was this actually slender ring called the Mu ring, which shares its orbit with MAB. So dirt stuff is coming off of MAB and spreading around Uranus. So with that insight, let's take seriously the idea that Nix and Hydra are dust producers and that they produce rings around Pluto. So. We had this great idea of how we could use Hubble to look for the rings in the Nix and Hydra orbits. Uh, if you look at this image, you can tell there's a lot of glare, and that's our limiting factor here. You just can't get rid of that glare from Pluto and Charon, but that glare isn't real. That's not stuff in space. That's light bouncing around inside the optics of the Hubble telescope, and we have a little bit of control over that. So here was the idea we had. Suppose we take two different images of the Pluto system. What we do on left is we pick a particular time, we take an image with Pluto and Charon as shown, and we have the rings, hypothetical rings of Nix, uh, oriented as shown. Then we wait a little while and we rotate the entire Hubble telescope 90 degrees and do it again. And we time it so that we get Charon in the same place relative to Pluto. Well, what we end up doing is that we get two images that where the glare patterns are essentially the same, but the rings have moved. So if we line up those images and then subtract them, most of that glare goes away. And what we're left with is two images of the rings, a positive and a negative, and that's exactly what we would be looking for. And we could get very sensitive detections of rings this way. We were very proud of this idea. We just thought it was fabulous. And uh, we patted ourselves on the back as we sent off our proposal to the Space Telescope Science Institute. And uh, a couple months later, this was the reply. Um, dear Mark, we regret to inform you that. Um, maybe I don't have to read any further. Has anybody else ever gotten a message that starts this way? Is it, is it ever good news? Um, it actually gets worse. Take a look at the bottom here. Your proposal was graded in the fourth quartile of proposals in your panel, with the first quartile being the top proposals. Ouch. <laughs> Not only did they rank us at the lowest of the low, but they felt it was necessary to, necessary to explain to us what it meant to be among the lowest of the low. In any normal universe, the story ends here. We can all go home. The story's ended. A fourth quartile proposal never, ever gets time on the telescope. That's just ridiculous. But the thing is, uh, newsflash, there's a spacecraft on its way to Pluto, and the planners of the New Horizons team, I was not on the team at the time, said, you know, they care a lot about whether they're going to find this or whether they're going to find this, because they have to fly through it, and they want to know what's there. So there were back-channel communications, apparently, and the next thing we knew, we got time on the telescope for our fourth quartile proposal. <laughs> Don't plan on this ever happening. All right. So uh, here we are, June 28th, 2011. We've gotten our first set of images. Uh, there's uh, Pluto and Karen, just as I kind of planned it. They're kind of overexposed. That's why there's all that glare around it. I've drawn in this orange ellipse what hypothetically a ring ought to look like in this image. And um, then there is this other problem with these images, all those stars. Um, I've worked with the other planets on the Hubble telescope, and you almost never see a star in the images. But Pluto is right in front of the core of our galaxy, Sagittarius. Uh, it is basically the densest star field in the sky, so anytime you look at Pluto, that's kind of what you get. And uh, I guess I at first have to admit I wasn't quite prepared for that, but uh, here's one of my image processing tricks. I've had a few tricks up my sleeves over the years. 
uh, suppose we stop this movie, that's a movie with 10 frames in it, and instead of thinking of it as a sequence in time, let's think of it as a big cube. It's basically a stack of 10 images. And maybe if I kind of turn it on, my, on its side, you'll get a better sense of what I'm talking about. So there's the top five of our stack of 10 images. Um, those images are essentially identical except for those stupid stars that we don't really want to be there that are marching their way through. So I can apply a particular math operation called sort, uh, which says all the bright pixels, I want them to go up to the top. Stars float. And everything that's dark, I want to go down. And that, says st that stack of images then becomes this stack of images. So let's take a look now at our stack. At first, you might think we haven't done ourselves any favors. <laughs> but in fact, as you start peeling off the top layers of this stack, the images actually clean up very nicely. The stars disappear. Uh, finally, we get to a point where you can very easily see Nix and Hydra, those two little dots that our colleagues had discovered. And uh, depending on the lighting and where you're sitting, I don't know if you can tell, but there's another dot there. Uh, we had actually realized when we planned these observations that we would be taking the longest exposures of Pluto that anybody had ever tried before, and that if there was a tiny little moon there, we might actually find it. Uh, I hope you can see it. It's actually in the circle there. And uh, that I had, was looking at after a couple of hours of having downloaded the data from the Stel Space Telescope Archive. Uh, and that was the discovery of uh, what we were called at the time P4. Well, one little dot doesn't prove anything, but we were very suspicious. Uh, we had a week to wait before we got our next set of images from the telescope. But when we did, we saw that little dot. It had moved just about the right amount to be going around Pluto. And uh, so that was the discovery of P4. Uh, and this is from the uh, NASA press release that went out just a, a couple of weeks later. So no rings. It was a negative result. But you know, we got a nice consolation prize. Um, this got the attention of my colleagues on the New Horizons team, because they have to fly through this system at 14 kilometers per second. That's pretty fast, 10 miles per second. Even something the size of a grain of sand is potentially dangerous to the spacecraft. So everybody starts thinking, if we didn't know that moon was there, what else don't we know is going on in the Pluto system? I mean, it's a kind of scary question. It's uncharted territory for a spacecraft. So the following year, working with the team, uh, working with the Space Telescope Institute, we had a much larger allocation of time. And uh, so we spent uh, probably uh, 10 times as much time as we had had in the previous year uh, scouring through very, very long exposures of Pluto. And uh, in one set of those images, here is what I found. Uh, there's, let's see what we can do, uh, going back. There is basically P4 we knew about, there's Hydra, there's Nix, and there's the other P4. Um, at least it looks about the same. That uh, kind of took us by surprise, but that is in fact uh, the discovery of P5. And this is a sequence of images where you can actually see a little bit of movement, which absolutely nails it that this is a real, actual object orbiting Pluto. So it was after, shortly after that, in July 2012, that we announced that uh, there were now five moons of Pluto. Um, and that's when we got to the issue where, by this point, we had accumulated a pretty large group of people. Nobody could agree on the name exactly, and we had some interesting discussions. But the names of moons of Pluto come out of the characters from Greek and Roman mythology about the underworld. It's a really colorful cast of characters to choose from, but we decided we can't make up our minds. Why don't we let the public do it? And uh, that's how we got the name Styx and Kerberos assigned to these objects. Kerberos is the three-headed dog who guards the gates of Hades. Uh, Styx is the river that separates the world of the living from the world of the dead. How many people voted? Any people participate in that in here? Okay. Good, good. I'm glad you did. Um, so, um, all right. So that's how we got to five moons of Pluto. That's how I became a Pluto scientist, more or less by accident. Um, when you talk about peculiar sequences of improbable results, of improbable events, um, this is actually kind of reminiscent to the, of the discovery of Pluto itself. So I thought I'd talk about that for a minute. Um, this was going back now to uh, 1915, 1916, a man named Percival Lowell, who uh, uh, you may know his name. He was actually responsible for the idea that there were uh, canals on Mars, uh, which isn't true. But uh, he was actually, in spite of that, a really, really fine astronomer. Um, he built an observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. And he was totally obsessed by the concept of Planet X. 
The problem they were dealing with at the time is that now that we knew about Neptune, Neptune had been discovered maybe 50 years earlier, Uranus 100 years before that, and uh, there seemed to be some kind of weird wobbling in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. And in fact, they discovered Neptune because there was wobbling in the orbit of Uranus, and they said, oh, I wonder if there's another planet out there that's messing with Uranus, and they looked and found Neptune. So Planet X was this concept of there could be another planet out there that is messing around, perturbing the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. And Percival Lowell actually did the calculation and said, I know where that body has to be. And he spent years studying the sky looking for Planet X. Uh, too many years, in fact. Uh, it took a toll on his health, and he died of a stroke in 1916, never having seen Pluto. Um, although in one of the great ironies of history, he took, of course, hundreds of photographic plates that stayed in the Flagstaff archives. Uh, people went back afterward. Turns out in 1915, he had, he had taken a, about a half dozen different photographs of Pluto. He just never had recognized that it was the little guy that was moving relative to all the others. So kind of sad for, for Percival Lowell. But at about the same time as his death, uh, there was a very young boy, uh, 11 at the time, this is obviously a later picture, named Clyde Tombaugh. Uh, Clyde was a farm boy living in Kansas, took an interest in astronomy, bought his first telescope from the Sears catalog. When that wasn't good enough, he built his own telescope. And around 1928, he uh, sent some of his astronomical drawings to the Flagstaff Observatory, the Lowell Observatory. They offered him a job. And so he shows up in Flagstaff in 1928. Uh, amongst his job responsibilities were sweeping the floors and looking for Planet X, because after Lowell died, uh, that project had just kind of dropped. So it was actually just uh, less than two years later that uh, he came up with this pair of images. And if you can look closely, they're essentially identical star fields. They were taken about a week apart, uh, 23rd and 29th of January, 1930, it says. And there's a little arrow pointing to a dot that is not at the same place in each of these images, where all the other stars are about the same place. So that was the discovery of Pluto. Now, the way he did that was with something called a blink comparator, where he would alternate between those two images. Uh, this is the actual device he used. Now, can you imagine what it's like to stare into that eyepiece hour upon hour upon hour comparing two, two different astronomical plates at a time and trying to get your eyes to match them up and then see if something is moving. Well, you don't have to imagine because I'm going to play that game for you. Let's do it. All right, so these are the images. So uh, let's put them together and we, we've got computers now. This is easy. So here is our digital blink co comparator. And uh, I think maybe you can see that whereas all the other stars are just about the same, uh, that little arrow is pointing to a dot that moves. Everybody agree with that? You can see that okay? You know, there's one, one difference, though, that when Clyde Tombaugh did it, there weren't little arrows. And so let's make it just a little harder. Uh, same set of images. Now I have just erased the arrows. Can people still see it? Uh, let's see. It's uh, somewhere over here. There it is. It's there. And then it's there. We're going back and forth. Okay. You had arrows. I've guided you through this. So let's play it for real now. I'm going to show you the same set of images. The only difference is that I've moved Pluto. So uh, who sees Pluto? It's not as easy as you might have thought. You know, raise your hands, some of you. A lot of you. Good. Uh, all right. I'll make it easier for everybody. It's near the upper right. There's uh, little red circles that show you where, where Pluto is. So, does that work for people? OK. All right. I actually made it kind of easy because I picked a really blank part of that star field to put that dot, just so I was hoping you'd all find it. Let's do this one more time. So, where's Pluto? So, what some of you may be seeing is a blinking star, which is actually an asteroid that's in the foreground. But asteroids move much faster so an asteroid would be there, and then it would be gone. It wouldn't move. It would simply not be there a week later. Uh, so you can, see, uh, you can see maybe down at the bottom here, there's an asteroid. That's got to be an asteroid. Anybody else see Pluto? Well, I'm glad I'm standing behind this podium, and hopefully you don't have anything to throw. There is no Pluto. I just deleted Pluto. <laughs> and and I, I had a reason for that, which is that 
Tom Bell didn't have arrows. He didn't even have just two images where the job was, OK, find Pluto in these two images. He had hundreds of plates, pairs of plates that he had to study, staring through that little eyepiece. And yet, he managed to find Pluto. And that's one of just the great uh, jobs of astronomical discovery that I think has ever been done. So uh, it's not as easy as it looks, folks. That's just my message. All right. Well, so we've got Pluto. How big is this thing? Uh, 1931, uh, the first calculation for the size of Pluto had it about the size of the Earth. And that was based on this idea that it is planet X, that it is perturbing the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. And because of that, it's got to have a certain amount of mass, and that means it's got to be a certain size. Uh, 1948, a great planetary astronomer named Gerard Kuiper figured out that it had to be actually a little smaller than that because uh, it just didn't need quite so much mass to mess around with Uranus and Neptune. Uh, let's jump ahead quite a few years to 1976. By the way, Dave Morrison was one of the people who did this observation, uh, was looking at Pluto with an with a instrument that actually measures light spectrum, basically how light varies with the wavelength, the color of light in effect. And they determined that this, this object has methane ice on its surface. Now, methane ice is very, very bright. And if it's very, very bright, and we know how much light is reflected, that means the object has to be a lot smaller than we thought. And so suddenly, Pluto shrank radically in 1976. And so now our comparison to the Earth isn't so good anymore. So let's compare it to the moon. And it's already a bit smaller than the moon. And then two years after that, uh, they just, when they discovered Charon, the moon of Pluto, of Pluto uh, that's, that nailed down the mass. And pretty much that's the size that we know Pluto is today. So the incredible shrinking Pluto, there was a prediction that it would disappear and then go negative at a certain point. Uh, but it stopped there. That's really how big it is now. Um, uh, interesting just uh, historical note, what the heck was going on with Planet X? There never was a Planet X. It turns out that when Voyager got to Neptune, got a better measurement of the mass of Neptune, uh, was determined that Neptune was the only thing perturbing the orbit of Uranus, there never had to be a Planet X. So the predictions of Planet X were bogus. And not only that, there was no reason why Pluto had to be at the location where Percival Lowell predicted Planet X to be. So it was just this weird, crazy coincidence that led to the discovery of Pluto probably decades ahead of when it would actually have otherwise been discovered. And in fact, what we know now today is that Pluto is one of many objects. It's kind of a weird uh, orbit. And there's a whole set of objects past Neptune called the Kuiper Belt. Uh, most of them are smaller than Pluto or a lot further out. Uh, maybe Eris, the, the largest other one we know about, is kind of comparable to Pluto. We don't really know which one is bigger anymore. Well, this put the uh, International Astronomical Union in a tizzy, for apparently, uh, because they had nine planets. Everybody had grown up. There were nine planets, right? So what do you do with Eris being actually at the time thought to be a little bit bigger than Pluto, even though it was much further away? Uh, so they decided, we can't have children counting to 10. Oh my god. And soon they'll run out of fingers. So instead, they came up with a rule. And the rule is as follows. A planet is a celestial body that. And essentially, the key point is that, that to be a planet, it has to have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. And that's something that qualifies Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, but Pluto does not qualify. And so they came up with a term that actually is a kind of useful term, dwarf planet, that is essentially the same definition, except it has not cleared its neighborhood. Let me make a metaphor, just uh, sort of explain to you how this all works. So this is a podium, right? We like this podium. It's a nice podium. Look around the room. This is the dominant podium in this room. So it's OK to call it a podium, right? All right, suppose we take this podium and carry it outside. Well, now it's the same podium, but it's in the great outdoors. We don't really know if it's the dominant podium there anymore. There might be a podium in the parking lot. There might be a podium across the other side of 280. Who knows? But whatever it is, it's no longer the dominant podium. So because of that, according to the IAU, it is now a dwarf podium. <laughs> And the key point, according to the IAU, is that a dwarf podium is not a podium. So that's, uh, that's, that's the nature of the decision they made. Um, honestly, you know, I'm giving them a hard time. I don't really have a problem with the term dwarf planet. I think it's actually a useful concept. 
But this idea that a dwarf planet is not a planet, that doesn't even make sense with logic, with language. It just doesn't make any sense. I have a dwarf apple tree in my backyard. I'm pretty sure it's still an apple tree. So uh, I think that's where our language and our logic are going to have to, the IU has a little bit of work to do to catching up with things. Meanwhile, it's called, we'll call it a dwarf planet. Call it whatever you like. Just don't call it boring. So uh, I'm going to now jump to the thing I study about Pluto. Uh, if you had anybody else on the New Horizons team here, they would go off in a totally different direction for the next five minutes or so. But I study orbits. I think that's been made pretty clear. Let me draw in those orbits. Uh, you can see now that they are very, very nicely nested. Well, they're ellipses because of the way we see it on the sky. They're really circles, of course. Um, how beautifully separated they are, almost like the uniformly, sep you know, the uniform steps between them, kind of think like Russian dolls or something. Uh, this is telling us something, and this is actually very surprising. Uh, we don't see this when we look at the satellite systems of the other planets. Um, so let me uh, talk to you a little bit about orbital dynamics, just for fun. Okay, we have a planet, and we have a moon, and we all have this kind of concept that's pretty straightforward, that the moon goes around the planet. And usually it's pretty close to a circle, which is what I've drawn here. Now, everything changes, however, when you have a double planet. Uh, and that's what we've got in the case of, of, of Charon and Pluto. Charon is about half the size of Pluto. It's got more than 10% the mass of Pluto. So the two of them actually don't, it's not like Charon is going around Pluto. It's basically the two of them going around their common, what's called the barycenter, which is that plus in the middle of that, uh, of that drawing. So interesting no, side note, I mean, even though we all, if you've ever studied mechanics, you know that this is how it's supposed to work. I still find it really weird to wrap my head around the fact that you could actually go to Pluto, sit in the middle of the system, and say, hey, everybody, the world really revolves around me. And it'd be true. Um, maybe that's our uh, uh, travel marketing opportunity for the 22nd century. I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's a very interesting thing when you actually have to deal with it, that there is a hole in the middle of the Pluto system. But now think about what that does. Now you're not orbiting one object. You're orbiting two objects. And so let's follow that yellow dot as it goes around. Sometimes it goes outside the circle, sometimes it goes inside the circle. It's actually wobbling all over the place because it's actually being pushed and pulled by this dumbbell, two objects going around each other. That's, um, that makes kind of a mess of things, and we actually can measure those wobbles in the orbit of the moons of Pluto. But uh, let's actually, it's not just that complicated, it's even more complicated because remember, there are four of these outer moons. So let's let the whole thing go, and oh my gosh, what a mess. These things are all, now all actually wobbling based on their being kicked around by Charon and Pluto, but they have enough gravity that they're also kicking around each other. And that, uh, that makes for a different world of dynamics, and that's one of my favorite topics in dynamics, so give me a minute here to just uh, go and talk about that. Because when I talked about a circular orbit, you can think of that as a very periodic thing, and it's kind of like a pendulum. We all understand how pendulums work, uh, periodic motion. Uh, you could even imagine using a, something like this to tell time, right? I mean, it's actually very, very predictable. I'm going to make one little correction now. Let's see what I'm going to do. I'm just going to stop it, and I am going to add a hinge. So now it's not a single pendulum anymore. It's called a double pendulum. A simple pendulum, a single pendulum, that was really simple. So now what? It's going to be, what, twice as complicated. How complicated can it be, right? Uh, let's let it go and see what happens. Um, that's a little weird. <laughs> um, this is actually a totally new regime of dynamics. It's called chaos. This system, <laughs> appropriately, obviously, this system will never repeat. You cannot predict what this system will do five minutes from now. It is literally impossible to predict the future because you can never know enough about the present. Any tiny change in the present state of that system will affect what it's doing a minute or two from now. Um, chaotic systems actually turn up a lot. Um, I, we've maybe heard the idea that the weather is, is chaotic, the idea that a, a, a a, um, a moth or a uh, butterfly flapping its wings in the Amazon can f affect the weather in San Francisco three weeks later. That is literally true, and that's because it's a chaotic system where the smallest change in your initial conditions can change radically your outcomes. So um, there we have a double pendulum. There we have chaos. 
And going back to the Pluto system, we're in a world of chaos. There is no question that this is a chaotic system. Um, but there would be one way to solve that problem. And the way to solve that problem is something called resonances. So let me show you that real quick. I'm going to make this into a horse race. So we've got a counter. Now, I'm going to let this whole system go. And we're going to count how many times Karen goes around Pluto. One, two, three. Well, glory be, when you look at the Pluto system, after three rotations of Karen around Pluto, Styx, the innermost moon, the small moon, is back where it started at, more or less. And if we wait one more, there, it turns out that Nix is actually lined up. So that's a four to one resonance, where Styx was a three to one resonance. And if we let it go again, you guess where this is going. Kerberos is almost precisely in a five to one resonance, and Hydra is almost precisely in a six to one resonance. So those resonances we see elsewhere in the solar system, and they do kind of lock things together. They wouldn't necessarily eliminate the chaos, but they kind of make the system kind of cohere a little bit better. And that's a beautiful result that is totally wrong. Because <laughs> when we actually look at the fine extra decimal places in all these orbits, uh, they don't quite line up. They're actually a little bit off. The blue and green ones off to the right, they're really close. Uh, Kerberos and, and, and Hydra are very, very close to their 5 to 1 and 6 to 1 resonances. Uh, Nix is a little further off, and then Styx innermost in red is the furthest off. So there's not, and, and by the way, it's not, like, uh, it's not like horseshoes where being close to a resonance counts. You're either in it or you're not. So there's really something puzzling here. But let's just take a look. Think of it as a pie slice. All of those objects are within 36 degrees of being in, at this line that we say would be a resonance. What are the chances that four objects, each independently, would land that close to being in a resonance? Well, the answer is one in 10,000. I'm guessing that means that this is telling us something. We just don't know what it's telling us, that there used to be a resonance, or it's kind of a weird resonance. We don't know. But anyway, the whole question of what's holding together the Pluto system, and even if it's stable, even if it's going to stay like that for a long time, is completely unknown at this point. We can also, however, ask questions about how those satellites got there. And there we have, um, we have a little bit of a better idea. How do you make a double planet? And uh, Kablooey, that's how you make a double planet. It's actually not that difficult, because in the solar system, particularly in the early history of the solar system, things collide with each other a lot. And so this kind of thing can happen. And so here you have some object hitting proto-Pluto and making a big mess. Let me show you a, um, a numerical simulation that was done by Robin Knopp, a research scientist at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, she generously let me uh, show her amazing video. Uh, some big object plows into Pluto. And then you can see it makes a big mess. A lot of stuff stays bound together at the middle. Uh, but a lot of the debris that's surrounding it starts to accrete, it starts to coalesce into larger lumps. And that you could kind of imagine being the formation of Charon uh, in the orbit, uh, in orbit around Pluto, and then maybe some of that leftover debris that was a little further out, maybe that's what actually formed the uh, little guys, Nix, Styx, Kerberos, and Hydra. Um, really great idea. Um, I just lied to you again. Um, this had nothing to do with the formation of Pluto. This was actually a simulation that Robin did of the formation of the Earth-Moon system, which is kind of, but not quite, another, another double planet. Whereas Charon is half the size of Pluto, our moon is about a quarter the size of the Earth. So we're not really a double planet, but we're pretty close. Um, but those were, at first I showed them just to scale relative to one another. This is how far apart they are if you draw them to scale. People don't always appreciate how far away the moon really is. Um, but let me make a comparison. Here we go, there's the Earth and the Moon as we see them today. And then I've basically blown up Pluto and the whole Pluto system to the same size as the Earth. So you can see that now kind of the Moon is out a little bit around or a little bit past Hydra in this, uh, in this little thought experiment. The Moon is very, uh, is very interesting though because it's, it's spiraling away from us. It's doing so very, very slowly. But the reason is that our ocean, we have a a planet with an ocean, and that ocean means water is sloshing around. And we all know about tides. The moon is tugging on the Earth and creating these tides. All that water is sloshing around. It dissipates energy, and the moon spirals away. So if we play this back in time, a couple of billion years, like maybe four, like roughly the age of the system, then the moon was actually pretty close in distance, relatively speaking, to where Karen is to Pluto today. 
By the way, the moon is moving away from us at about you know, that far per year, something like an inch and a half, a couple of, a couple of centimeters. Um, one way to think about it, the moon moves away from the Earth at about the same speed that your fingernails are growing. So every time you trim your toenails and fingernails, think about saying goodbye to the moon, because it's, it's gone. Uh, anyway, so this got me to thinking that, uh, you know, so if we go back four billion years, we actually have something very similar to the pluto charon system right here that we're standing on. And suppose that in that big impact that created the, the moon, Suppose there were some little, you can see them as red dots, suppose some, some little uh, Nixes, Stixes, Kerberuses, and Hydras also in orbit around the Earth. They might have been there. If they were, then over the last four billion years, our moon has swept them up. So what we see when we look at the pluto charon system could actually be, and I think it is, it's the ancient past of our Earth frozen in time for us to see. It's got the same history. It's, uh, it's just that because the Earth has tides and the moon is going away, our system has evolved and the Pluto system has been frozen. So I think that's a kind of interesting way to think about it. It gives you a little more respect for a tiny distant dwarf planet, doesn't it? So let me now just move on to, uh, to our mission. We have a spacecraft called New Horizons. It's on its way to Pluto, very close to Pluto, in fact. Uh, this is the actual spacecraft as it was being constructed. Uh, it's about the size of a grand piano, so that maybe lets you get your, um, manage a concept of how big it is. Uh, for comparison, this is kind of small compared to other NASA spacecraft. Uh, Cassini is about the size of a small bus, for example. So this is very, very small. And that's kind of the point. You want it to be small so it can move fast. Uh, we have a bunch of science instruments on there. Um, I'll just sort of roughly label them in general idea. Rex is the radio science instrument, is that big antenna which is, of course, also used for communications with the Earth, but it can be used for other kinds of things as well. Uh, NASA scientists like to use really clever acronyms like Pepsi and SWAP, uh, but those are charged particle instruments. LORI, the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, uh, overly cute, I think, but uh, that's LORI, that's the best, that's the camera we've got. Um, and Ralph and Alice are not acronyms, it's just that our PI likes the honeymooners. So, so Ralph and Alice are there. Ralph does uh, color and infrared, uh, whereas Alice does ultraviolet. Um, here we are, January 16th, or 19th, <coughs> excuse me, 2006. Uh, this is the uh, launch of the, uh, of the New Horizons spacecraft. Put a small, a small spacecraft on a big rocket so you can go really fast. And let me just add that among those long sequences of, of improbable events, this is another one. NASA planned and then canceled and then planned and then canceled Pluto missions over and over again. And our principal investigator, Alan Stern, uh, deserves a huge amount of credit for this ever coming to be. And uh, unfortunately, that's a great story, but it's a story I can't tell. So uh, I'm just going to have to move forward on that. But so after the launch, here we are, obviously animation. Uh, but we are going as fast as you can possibly go with the, tel with the uh, technology we've got. Uh, away from Earth. Uh, the, this spacecraft passed the, passed the orbit of the moon in nine hours, and it reached Jupiter, astonishingly, in 13 months. That's a long way to go, by the way. Uh, so here we actually had a chance to uh, use the instruments and do some, do some Jupiter science. Uh, here's a nice illustration of how our different instruments work together. Uh, we were really lucky that there was this enormous uh, volcano called Vashtar uh, on the north, northern tip of, uh, of Io that was going on at exactly the time we got there. We didn't, uh, we couldn't have planned that. It, it was just great, great good fortune. And on the left, we have an image taken by Lori. Lori is our best camera for doing fine resolution stuff, but it has no color filters, so it's only giving us black and white. Uh, another camera, part of the Ralph instrument, is what produced that color image at the upper right, where if you can look very closely, the uh, the, uh, the, the plume is actually kind of bluish. It's got a different character to it that we can learn uh, from having color that we can't learn in the black and white. Uh, finally, we, can have, we have an instrument that goes further into the infrared, and that is where we actually start to see glowing hot spots on the dark side of Io, including the very, very bright dark spot, which is this volcano itself, but quite a few others as well. So we cover a lot of the spectrum with our different instruments, and that gives us a way to understand things that one instrument or one set of eyeballs wouldn't, wouldn't be able to. Uh, 
we had a really lucky occurrence that uh, we hadn't actually planned to take any images, and I really can't recount the whole details, but uh, nevertheless, uh, some crazy ring images that I planned turned out to be terrible for rings, but what they did involve was I.O. and one image taken about five minutes apart in a sequence of four. We didn't plan on there being an active volcano, so nobody planned on making movies, but sort of by accident, uh, this ring image, quote unquote, actually created the only movie that exists of active volcanoes erupting on an object, not the Earth. All right, we finished with Jupiter. We got a little extra boost from flying by Jupiter, and here we are at the present day, uh, roughly speaking, on, on Pluto's doorstep, you might say. Uh, the spacecraft is operating extremely well. It's uh, in great shape. Um, we can show you uh, back in July, we got a set of images, and oh, it's only going to get better than this. But there you have Pluto and Charon, Charon going around Pluto, uh, just to prove that we've got a camera that works, really. So let me, um, let me talk a little bit about what's coming up. Uh, it's, uh, it's, can't really predict, but we can make some educated guesses. One way that we can make an educated guess about the Pluto system is by comparing it to Triton. Triton is the large moon of Neptune. It's very peculiar in that it's going around Neptune the wrong way. Everything else goes around Neptune one way, and it's going around the other way. It can't possibly have formed that way. The only way this object could have shown up at Neptune is if it fell in from the Kuiper Belt, got trapped into orbit around Neptune. And so this is a Kuiper Belt object that has just kind of been captured for us to see. So when Voyager got to Neptune, we did this flyby of, of Triton, and we got some really nice close-up looks. Uh, this is a beautiful animation done by Paul Shank, who's on our team, uh, taking all of the Voyager data we got and just animating it together using realistic terrain models, using realistic colors, and it just gives you a sense of what, uh, of what Triton really looks like. And so let's just, uh, let's just run through that for a minute. Uh, it's... Um, the one thing you will notice, among many, is that it is not just a gray cratered sphere. It's, um, it's got colors. Here's another, here's another image. Uh, this is often called the cantaloupe image because it kind of looks like the surface of a cantaloupe. I'm not a geologist, but what we're seeing here is a very young surface. We're seeing, we're seeing a surface where stuff is happening. Uh, if you ever look at, well, even the moon, you see that mostly it's pretty static. You see craters, it's gray. You see some maria that are a little different. But here, there is stuff going on. There are areas that have different colors, which means different chemicals are on their surface. Things are presumably moving around. The other thing I think you'll notice, I'll, I'll show you an example. What's missing from this image? Anybody? Well, because there's only one of them. It's sort of three off. There's one crater there. And if you look closer, there's a couple others. Uh, look at other solar system bodies, and they're just covered with craters. This is a very young surface. So this is a surface that is churning. There is interior stuff going on that is manifested on the exterior. Uh, this is an alive body, an active body. And that's, um, that's really exciting, and that gives us some interesting thoughts about what might be going on in Pluto. Uh, it gets even better than that. Uh, this is kind of hard to interpret, but maybe if I can call your attention, these are three Voyager images taken uh, about 20 minutes apart each. In the bottom one, I hope you can see a long black streak, horizontal. You see that? So if you go up, that streak is kind of half as long in the panel above and kind of not there in the panel above. So in 20 minutes, a black streak formed, or 45 minutes, whatever it is. Uh, that's volcanic activity. There, is, there was an eruption going on on Triton as Voyager flew by. It's uh, not, not the kind of volcanoes we're used to. It's an ice volcano. It is basically... Uh, driven by the squeezing of icy material rather than magmas like on the Earth. But basically something got spewed up out of a hole, then got caught in the prevailing but very thin winds that are there, and got straight, sprayed out into a long streak. So, Triton is alive. It's a very active object, and I think all of our indications are that we're not going to be disappointed when we get to Pluto. Here you can see the best images we've got of Pluto today. Painstaking work by Mark Bui, who I work with on the, on the New Horizons team, uh, has just, he's so patient, and he has taken images with the Hubble telescope uh, over a very long period of time and assembled them and run supercomputers and has managed to make this map of the surface of Pluto. 
there is a lot of contrast in that image. There are some very, very dark areas and some very, very bright areas, some yellowish, some not so yellowish. Uh, that's all, once again, the indication that this is a live world. Uh, but we just don't really know what it looks like yet. That's the best we can do. Well, let's make an analogy. I like to make analogies. Suppose we saw this in the sky. Would we have any idea that this is what was in store? I mean, there were, when I go, go back, going back, that is sort of comparable to the resolution we've got on Pluto today. So this is Pluto then, and this Pluto coming up in July is going to be something with that kind of detail. Let's play another game. I like games. Suppose we saw this in the sky. Any suggestions what we'd really be looking at? <laughs> Ideas? Come on. Somebody, I heard somebody say Mars. That's used, often people guess Mars. Fortunately, it's not Mars. <laughs> so, all right, you're not going to get it, so I'll show you. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's what, th what that was an image of. So who would have known that that's what we were going to see? Let's do one more. Anybody? So I'll give you one clue. Uh, to get this one right, you have to think like me. It's Pluto. Hey, somebody got it. OK. So that's just my silly joke. Sorry. But the point being that we really could have almost anything when we see uh, Pluto, the planet, or dwarf planet. So let's, uh, let's take another look. Uh, we, have, uh, we don't know what this is going to look like, but we can describe what sort of things are going on. Our geologists on the team have worked with some artists. And this is a guess at what we're going to see. Uh, it's got some very, very black areas. Some areas are basically as dark as asphalt. It's also got some areas that are as bright as snow. Uh, some of it's yellow, some of it's white. There's a lot of interesting chemistry going on there. That's probably a decent idea of what we're going to be seeing when we finally get to Pluto. I also want to call your attention, if you look maybe at the top there, there is a, uh, there's a little bit of haze on the, on the, on the top. Uh, we happen to know that Pluto has an atmosphere. Uh, that's kind of surprising for something so far away, so cold. But uh, there is actually enough uh, material, uh, stuff that is frozen on the surface that can occasionally get heated up by the sun, turn into gas, and hang around for a little while. The way we know about these kinds of uh, atmosphere, uh, about atmosphere, is through a bunch of experiments that have been done over the years called stellar occultation. So let me just show you an example of what I mean by that. Uh, suppose we were looking at a body, let's make it Pluto, Pluto purple and with a ridiculously colored red atmosphere, and a star. And then we just happened to wait till a particular moment when the star was going to pass behind Pluto as seen from the Earth. So when that happens, the star blinks out as it goes behind the planet, and then it blinks back on again when it's done. So what we see is a, drop, a drop in brightness when the star is behind the planet. Well, that's kind of obvious. The planet's opaque. But if you look at those red lines on the sides there, they are not vertical. They're at a kind of a ramp. And that's our indication that there is actually an atmosphere, because if there were a no atmosphere, it would be a straight drop down. Uh, so we know that the atmosphere of Pluto exists. We know it varies over time because we've done many of these occultations. So once again, it's a living world. It's a world that's going to be changing before our eyes. Uh, Charon, on the other hand, um, may be one of those cratered spheres I mentioned. Uh, we've done the uh, same gentleman, Mark Bowie, who's done so much beautiful work on Pluto itself, uh, has studied Charon. There just doesn't seem to be quite as much variation, there much, quite as much color. So, uh, so Karen, you know, we'll see. I mean, no matter what happens, it'll be interesting, and I'd be delighted to be proven wrong. Uh, and let's just say for sure that I'm almost going to be proven wrong. That's a given. Just, so uh, what, what, what will happen, what will it look like when we get close-ups of Pluto? Well, here's one example. Uh, I think maybe most of us recognize this place, uh, San Francisco Bay. Um, this has been, uh, I took a Google map. I converted it to black and white, because that's what the LORI instrument will do. And I uh, changed the resolution down to 70 meters per pixel. The best resolution we're going to get on Pluto is like this. So if there is a bay and an Alcatraz and a Golden Gate Bridge on, San, on, on Pluto, we'll see it. Just to be careful, I am not making that prediction. But, but, just, but we would see it if it's there. So that's the kind of data we have to look forward to coming up in July. Or at least the best data will look like that. Some of it won't be that good, of course. 
All right, so here we are. Uh, one of our animators put this together. We're approaching Pluto, uh, and then of course Karen. We're actually going to get uh, we're going to get pretty close to Pluto. We're going to go about 20,000 kilometers. That's really not very far away. Uh, this is the kind of a situation where we're going to see San Francisco Bay and the Bay Bridge, uh, if it's there. Um, after that, we'll do a bit of a flyby of Charon, get the same kind of rough resolution on Charon itself. And then a very important thing happens, which is we go into what we call occultation. This is, a, this is a sun occultation and an earth occultation. So as seen from Earth of the Sun, the New Horizons spacecraft is going behind. And that's very important for a couple of reasons. One is that you can see now this kind of weird yellow glow around the limb. That's caused by the atmosphere. And this is a great way, a great geometry, a way to see the atmosphere. So we'll be able to make measurements of the atmosphere by doing this, and we'll also do a fly through the shadow of Karen as well. Uh, in addition, we have this instrument called REX, the big uh, radio telescope. And as we fly behind uh, Pluto and again by Charon, we have telescopes on the Earth that are going to be transmitting up to the uh, spacecraft. And then the spacecraft will be measuring the signal. And then as Pluto and Charon cut across, that signal will get another kind of occultation experiment. It's done with uh, radio waves rather than starlight, but it's the same idea. The Hubble telescope is going to be along for the ride this year. Uh, we're going to have about 60 hours on the telescope, which is a really nice allocation of time. Uh, images starting in a few weeks, in fact, and running through the whole year. So we'll have a kind of a Earth-based context for that brief period in July when we're much, much closer and getting the very best data from the New Horizons uh, spacecraft. We're also getting some help from SOFIA. This is a uh, uh, a, a 747 with a hole in the side. The fact that they can do that is kind of amazing to me, uh, but they're flying a telescope in a 747. Uh, this project is managed both at NASA Ames and at NASA Dryden. Uh, that telescope can go anywhere. That's the advantage of having it on a 747. And we've got an opportunity to do a stellar occultation experiment of Pluto, a really good one, on June 29th. So that's just about two weeks before the flyby with New Horizons, so we'll get something that's pretty close in time to when we actually see the other data. Uh, but as you notice, that blue strip, that's where you have to be in order to see this occultation, and it's a long way away. It's a pretty isolated part of the planet. So, but because we have a 747 that can fly our telescope there, we will actually get some fantastic data on that stellar occultation. All right, uh, just kind of wrapping up but with a few things. Um, in addition to the science that I'm doing on the team, I have an extra responsibility. And I uh, share that responsibility, as I learned in January, just a few weeks ago, with someone you might know. So let's uh, hit play here. Is the sound up? Uh, we don't have sound. Anybody? Can we get that sound back? I can't take it, dude. You OK? No, I'm not OK. I feel like I'm going to jump out of my skin. I'm worried about the New Horizons space probe. What's he talking about? Nine years ago, he was part of a team that launched a spacecraft to collect data about Pluto. It's finally close enough, so this morning it turned itself on. Well, we hope. The signal has to travel over three billion miles, so it's going to be hours before we know if it even survived. Now we get to see him flip out because he's worried it was demolished by space ice. Space ice is no joke. <laughs> Can't even watch Frozen anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Raj. Um, I didn't actually know he was on the team, but welcome. Um, I guess I have to ask, what have you been doing these last nine years while well, the rest of us have been working our butts off? But uh, I need to riff off of something he said, which is very important. Space ice is no joke. Um, I wouldn't call it space ice. I'd call it dust particles or something else. But the fact is, we're in a situation where we're flying through the system at 14 kilometers a second. Anything the size of a grain of sand is dangerous to us. And uh, so I'm going to be part of the team that sits in the crow's nest, in effect. Uh, we're going to get to uh, uh, the mission operations facility about a month before almost everybody else. And as those last images come down before we get to Pluto, they're going to be, of course, getting better and better and better. It's our job to find anything, any moons, any rings, anything that might be potentially dangerous to the spacecraft, uh, model it, figure out whether it's dangerous or not report it to NASA, and then they will make the decision about what to do. Now, they can't, they can't say, oh, turn around. 
But we have, some, we have some evasive maneuvers, in effect, that we can make. There are a couple of alternative ways to fly through the Pluto system that we can revert to if we see a danger. Uh, hopefully that won't happen because those alternative flybys don't give you as good science, and we really optimized the one we want to do. Uh, so, and actually all the modeling we've done so far, and we've been running through this over and over as tests, uh, it's very difficult to put something in the path of that spacecraft. The place where it's flying through the system is one that is cleared out by Karen very effectively. So I suspect we're actually going to be okay, but we have to, uh, we have to be prepared, and uh, that's, uh, that's something that we'll be thinking about, and you'll probably be hearing about it in those last month or two as we approach Pluto. All right. Um, this is a... Uh, very busy graphic that uh, I encourage you to go online and find it. It's called 50 Years of Space Exploration. It's put out a few years ago by National Geographic. It contains every mission that we, and I, by which I mean Earthlings, have ever flown to any other body in the solar system. Uh, and it's just, it's just beautiful, but you have to blow it up to a much greater detail than I can do it here. But for example, there's Earth. And uh, if we zoom in on Earth, you can see that we've done a whole lot a whole lot there, I am, I'm circling. That, all those circles are around the moon. We've been to the moon a lot. Uh, also Mars on the right, also Venus on the left. Not only are these interesting science targets, but they're also fairly easy to get to compared to the outer solar system, where you will see that the number of lines is much less sparse. Uh, nevertheless, I have had a great privilege uh, in the just in the time I was born and the time I entered the field to have been able to hitch a ride on some of these uh, blue and green lines, including the Voyager mission and uh, Cassini, uh, that we've been able to uh, go out and get our first reconnaissance of these outer planets. And so that got me thinking about firsts, because uh, when you see something for the first time, there are always, always surprises. And when I go back through uh, the history of my recollection of the Voyager mission, uh, for example, uh, I was actually in college in 1979 during the Voyager flyby of Jupiter when we discovered that there are volcanoes on Io, something we would not have thought to go looking for. Uh, in, uh, in the same year, Voyager also discovered that Europa has the next satellite out, a large satellite of Jupiter, has an interior ocean. You can tell because it's got a kind of cracked surface and it's basically almost looks like icebergs that have been bouncing off each other. Uh, also in 1979, we discovered a dust ring around Jupiter, a topic dear to my heart because it was a topic of my dissertation, but also it was the first time we ever kind of imagined that a ring could be made up of dust, really, really fine particles, and not just these big ice balls that make up the rings of Saturn. 1980 and 81, we got to Saturn. Um, I guess I will just say in shorthand, uh, this is when we discovered that rings aren't boring. Uh, it was actually believed prior to the 1980 that the rings were going to be just kind of bland and uniform. There just wouldn't be anything much to see. And instead, there, nothing could be further from the truth. There's all kinds of structure, all kinds of detail. They're changing before our eyes. Uh, we saw these things, weird things called spokes in the movie at the lower right. And we saw something vaguely resembling braids uh, in one of the outer rings of, of, of Saturn. So jumping on outward to Neptune in 1989, we thought it was going to be a sort of bland cue ball, because that's kind of what Uranus looked like when we saw it. Uh, we didn't expect to see this kind of cloud structure so far from the sun. It's very cold out there, and the driver behind all this atmospheric activity is sunlight, fundamentally. So we would have expected uh, Neptune to be kind of boring, and yet we had strong winds, big clouds, a big storm, the big black, great black dark spot is called. Uh, totally not what we expected to see. Uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we found volcanoes, active ice volcanoes on, on Triton. And we also saw ring arcs, one of my fun topics, uh, incomplete rings. You can see a, a complete ring going around, but there are three large clumps that uh, still to this day we have uh, trouble understanding. So with that in mind, there is only one prediction I am willing to make about what, we are, what is going to happen in July, and that is that this will not be the headline of the New York Times on July 15th. Pluto revealed. It's pretty much what we expected, scientists report. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. I don't know what will happen, but it's not gonna be that. So, uh, back to this diagram. Pluto is not on this chart. Uh, Kuiper Belt is not on this chart. Uh, for the record, we are now in the 55th year of space exploration, and so this was five years ago. 
Um, in a very practical sense, we are about to march off this map. Uh, the Kuiper Belt is the, is the Mount Everest of solar system exploration, and Pluto is our last first. So uh, it's uh, quite, a, quite a remarkable thing to be a part of, and I want to make sure uh, that you all feel welcome to come along for the ride. Uh, we really don't know what to expect, except there are almost certainly some surprises in store. So thank you. Have you uh, given up on the possibility of rings, or do you think there's still a chance? I have not given up on the possibility of rings. Uh, it is certainly one of the things we're going to be looking for, as I said, in those uh, weeks and months coming up, approaching July, the July flyby. Um, however, one of the consequences of the, this chaos that I mentioned is that it's kind of hard to add more rings or moons to the Pluto system. It just doesn't stay stable very long. So I think the chances of finding rings are, have dropped a little bit. Um, from the standpoint of spacecraft safety, that's maybe an okay, but for me as a scientist, that's a little disappointing. Over here. You, you mentioned the SOFIA and Hubble tele, telescopes are gonna be observing during the flyby of, of Pluto. What, how is that observation focused, I guess. What are you trying to see from Earth-based or close to Earth-based telescopes while you're doing the flyby? Right. It's, um, let me clarify that it's not necessarily that the observations are happening at the exact time as the flyby. Hubble's got about six or seven months of data coming up this year. And what that means is you get time baseline because the flyby happens very fast. The whole flyby of the system is 10 hours maybe. So we get a huge amount of data for one specific moment in time. The only way we can put that in context is to have the best data we can get, which is Earth-based data, Hubble data, uh, spanning the period around the uh, flyby. And so, uh, so it will be providing context. Uh, in addition, the SOFIA observations themselves are actually two weeks before the flyby. That's just because you can't plan an, you can't tell the occultation when to happen. It happens when it happens. It's a great occultation, it will tell us a lot, but it will not be synchronous with the flyby itself. Hi, uh, thank you for that talk. Can I ask you a question that isn't about Pluto at all, but is about rings? I, sh I love, that's my favorite topic, sure. Excellent. Uh, earlier this week, they announced the discovery yes. of an exoplanet with rings over 200 times the diameter of Saturn's. Could you, how does that even work? And could you, could you comment on that? Uh, yeah, that's a great story. I am, I am not an expert on this topic. I will say that what you're seeing, um, you're seeing a debris, you're, you're seeing something in formation. You're not, when we look at Saturn's rings, they've been there a long time and they've been pretty much kind of like what we see for probably a very long time. The system that they found is a ring because it hasn't finished making moons. Uh, the, the only part, the only way to be a re stable ring is to be kind of close to the planet. There's kind of a barrier, uh, and inside that barrier you form rings, and outside that barrier you kind of clump together into moons eventually. Uh, it's called the Roche limit. And so what we're seeing is are moons in formation. Uh, but we got it at that special moment when they're still spread out and they're still in the process of accreting. It's a brilliant, beautiful, beautiful result, but I wouldn't call it a, a stable ring system. It's kind of a, a moment in time in the evolution of a debris disk. So extremely lucky. Yes. Thank well, you. we have a lot of targets to look at. They found one that was very interesting. It's sort of the numbers help because we have an instrument like Kepler that can actually keep finding these things. Yeah. Thank you. Over here. Uh -huh. For being that far out in space, while well, you think of g gas giants, not solid, but the pictures you show of Pluto su suggest that it's solid. Yes, Pluto is quite definitely solid, aside from a very thin atmosphere. Uh, that's, uh, that's based on, for example, the work that Dave Morrison, I mentioned, uh, seeing methane, uh, ice, methane ice on the surface. Uh, it's so much smaller uh, than anything like um, Jupiter or Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, in fact, it can't hold on to a big atmosphere because it is too small. You need gravity to hold on to those atmospheres, uh, otherwise they slowly escape. 
and uh, Pluto's atmosphere is slowly escaping, but it's replenished by this ice on the surface. So it's not a gas giant, it's not even a gas dwarf, it's a, it's a solid object. Uh, why do moon's, uh, moon's rotations get off track when there's a double planet that, are, that they are orbiting around? Could you say that again? I'm sorry. Why do moon's rotations get off track when there is a double planet that, are, that they are orbiting around? Um, they, it's basically because you, you're not orbiting one object, you're orbiting two objects, and those objects are kind of interfering with each other. So sometimes you can imagine, you know, when Charon is closer to you than Pluto, you're going to be orbiting kind of around Charon, but before you do that, it swipes around and Pluto becomes the thing that you're orbiting around. But then before that happens, you're back with Charon. And so that's what creates this kind of weird wobble in these orbits. <clears throat> okay, at one time in this mission, they were hoping to find other objects in the Kuiper belt right. that they could visit after they flew by Pluto. Did they ever find any good candidate or have they given up on that? Thank you so much for asking that question because it was just a, a piece of the story I didn't have time to tell. Uh, coming up to about a year ago, we were getting pretty desperate because we wanted this to be a Pluto and Kuiper Belt object and another Kuiper Belt, small Kuiper Belt object mission. Uh, and there had been expectation from the day of launch that given how many Kuiper Belt objects were being discovered, that there would always be one that's somehow close enough that they could do a little tweak of the orbit as they passed Pluto and actually reach this other object. And up till a year ago, they had not found any Kuiper Belt objects that would fit the bill. And then with a huge amount of, uh, of help from the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, some of my colleagues did this amazing observing campaign, and they found the object, which is now reachable. So it's within this little cone. So as they fly past Pluto, they're going to do a little bit of a tweak and head toward that object. And then some three, four years later, I forget the actual date, uh, there will be a flyby. Uh, whether it's up to NASA whether we actually get permission to do that observation. Now we know we have a target. But uh, if you wanted to you know, suggest to your Congress representatives that it's really important for New Horizons to do the second and final important part of its mission, uh, that's basically still open to a decision from NASA. And Pluto and Charon, I think you always keep the same face towards each other. Yes, they do. And they, are they close enough to actually exchange atmosphere? Uh, um, atmosphere go from one to the other? They are not, well, they have very thin, well, Pluto has a very thin atmosphere. As far as we know, Charon has no atmosphere. Uh, so there's no exchange of atmosphere. Yeah. And they're actually, they're about 20,000 kilometers apart, which is, mm. they're like 2,000 and 1,000 yeah. kilometers themselves. So they're pretty far apart. Okay. So there's not any exchange between them. Yeah. Um, what are some characteristics of Pluto that have not been discovered but are predicted to have due to prior, prior knowledge? Could you say that again, please? I'm sorry. Um, Speak right into the microphone. What are some characteristics of Pluto that have not been discovered yet, but are predicted to have based on prior knowledge? What are some, pr uh, that's a, ooh, you're in dangerous territory. Um, I mean, there are certainly people who talk about volcanoes. We certainly don't have any direct evidence that there are volcanoes on Pluto. We just see that sometimes things are changing a little bit. I think there would be a lot of people on my team who would be voting for Pluto or to have volcanoes. Uh, but I think there are, there are many things we could imagine. Uh, there are certainly going to be interesting kinds of landforms and all kinds of things. It will become a real world with landscapes that are nothing like we've ever seen before. It's another ring question. Uh, if I were in orbit inside of Saturn's rings, what, what would I experience? What would I see? Is that like a snowstorm, or how big are these particles? Uh, oh, literally within the rings. Uh, yes. You would be bouncing off of stuff. There would be, I mean, the biggest ring particles are maybe the size of this room, probably a bit smaller than that. Typical sizes are maybe basketballs or ping pong balls. Uh, and these are all bouncing off each other repeatedly, and they're going to bounce off you if you're in the middle of it. Uh, the dense part of the rings is really going to be this kind of like storm that you're in. Now, things aren't moving very fast. It's kind of uh, millimeters, millimeters per second or something like that. So you won't get crushed. You can push them away. Uh, but you're going to have a lot of friends. How far between ping pong balls then? Depends on where you are in the rings. Um, you know, and there are places where it's densely packed, where you couldn't really, you'd have to shove stuff out of the way if you were going to dig your way through the rings. But most places, it's more spread out than that. 
You'd mentioned a little bit earlier that the recession of the moon has something to do with energy used by the tides. And could yes. you elaborate on that as to what's happening there? Um, it's, well, let's see, how can I, I, I could write equations, but that's obviously not what you're looking for. Um, so the, uh, the, the moon raises a tide on the earth. And because of there's a little bit of a time lag, that tide is not exactly lined up with the Earth. It's a, it's a little bit ahead because the Earth is spinning much faster than the moon is going around. So what that means is that the moon is getting pulled by the tide that it is creating because that tide is not lined up with it. And that's the process that actually causes it to spiral outward. It's the time delay in the system that's doing it. I see. Yeah. That's fine. Thanks. What will happen to Pluto after it examines Pluto? What will happen to Pluto? Uh, what will happen to New Horizons? New Horizons. Um, so, well, actually, I should warn you, well, that's a really good question because one of the things we have to learn is patience. Uh, Pluto is going to, well, New Horizons is going to get a lot of data, and it is only going to be able to trickle that data down to Earth. We're going to have to wait about nine months till we have seen the, the complete set of data that has been obtained by New Horizons. So its first job is actually to slowly trickle that data down to Earth, and that's gonna be something that we're all gonna be anxious. So you're not gonna just see news on July 15th. You're gonna be seeing great discoveries coming even months and maybe even years afterward. Uh, but then, once it's done, uh, they're hopefully gonna do that flyby of another Kuiper Belt object. There's actually, uh, there, there's some discussion about what to do after that, but uh, I, I'm not really part of those discussions. Also, um, what does the spacecraft run on? Yeah, it has a, um, it has a nuclear generator. It's basically a, a pile of, of plutonium that gets hot. Uh, and that plutonium generates heat, and the heat then gets converted into electricity. But it's only, it's a very small amount of, of, of energy. We're talking about like 20 watts now. 20 watts, uh, you know, that light bulb that's blinding me is probably two, 300 watts. Uh, so the amount of power that's running the spacecraft is a lot smaller than uh, any light bulb you would normally see. Yeah, good question. This question is related to the last one from this side of the room. Uh, I understand that tidal friction is sucking energy out of the Earth-Moon system. Okay. Yes. But I find it surprising that that's causing the moon to actually get farther away. Wouldn't you expect that uh, by taking energy out of a system that the uh, orbital diameter would decrease instead of increase? So what it's, um, it's actually, what it's doing is it's also slowing down the Earth. So the Earth is changing. You're basically trading angular momentum between the Earth and the Moon. And uh, so basically the way you make that balance is that you change the rotation speed of the Earth. And it's actually not so much the energy part of it that, that does that. So in, in the limit, could the moon actually escape from the Earth? Uh, no, because what will eventually happen is that it will cause the Earth to stop rotating relative to the moon. When, as it's moving out, its period is, what, 29 days, and it will get a little longer, but it's slowing down the Earth's rotation. In fact, we know for a fact that if you go back uh, billions of years, the Earth's rotation was faster than it is now, and that's all because of the uh, rotational angular momentum that's been taken out of the Earth by the moon. And uh, so eventually the Earth will spin down until it's got one face toward the moon at all times, and that'll be the end of that evolution process. When, when they were designing the New Horizons, they had things that were driving the design. Were there really important instruments that sort of focused how that device was going to be created? or? Uh, or I mean, other the, constraints? the way we plan any of these spacecraft is that you devise a set of requirements. You have to be able to measure methane. You have to be able to s resolve the surface at 50 meters or something like that. And then you figure out what kind of an instrument suite will meet, will meet the bill. And then you shrink it until it can be as small as possible. So uh, I was not part of those discussions, but it's the requirements that are set. NASA even sets the requirements that have to be met by one of these missions. Yeah. Now. Okay, good. We're going to wrap up soon. Okay, so you were talking about the um, occultations or something? Occultations, yes. Occultations. So while the New Horizon spacecraft is behind Pluto, what is it going to measure? 
But when it's behind Pluto, it's going to be able to see the glow of atmosphere that is just around the limb. It's going to see a full circle of, of light coming from around the limb. That's what it'll be able to measure. The process as it's going into the shadow or out of the shadow, that's what we get with these radio occultations. Okay. So you already know there's an atmosphere on Pluto. So yes. now you're studying like how thick it is or... Exactly. And we don't know very much about it. It's not easy to see. We only have a glimmering that is there. It's kind of like knowing that there's a black spot and a white spot on the object. And that, when we see it, we'll actually have a whole map of the atmosphere. Okay. Yes. Next. So Clyde Tombox or Clyde T's ashes are on the New Horizons probe. Yes, they are. How much of, like how many... <laughs> I, I was not part of that exchange. I, I do not know. It's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, and what is the main source of the, what is the main source of propulsion for New Horizons? So there are uh, propulsion. I mean, after, I mean, it's basically been going on its own since it was launched, except for it's got some little thruster rockets. Uh, hydrazine, I think, is the name of the fuel. Uh, we have to budget that very carefully because, as I said, we're going to tweak the orbit to get to this Kuiper Belt object. That takes a certain amount of, of propellant, and uh, we only have so much propellant. You can't replace it, obviously. So does that mean that adding that person's ashes to the space probe made the project more expensive? I, infinitesimally so. I think it's not a lot of ashes, yes. yes. OK, we're down to maybe one more question, or I'll say two more questions. This is it. All right. How did you decide how close to the planet to do the flyby? So uh, once again, a lot of that discussion happened prior to my uh, arrival on the team. Uh, it's very clear that they picked a good spot. They picked the sweet spot for safety reasons, but that wasn't really their high criteria, and they weren't necessarily thinking about all these moons and rings at the time. Uh, they picked a spot that was going to get close enough to Pluto and Charon and also fly through their shadows. It was really critically important that they fly through the shadows. And that really puts a very strict constraint on what you can do. The well, last question over here. Um, so the spacecraft got to Jupiter in nine months, and it has 13. This, oh, 14 months. Yeah. And um, it had the energy of, what, 20 watts? Something um, like that. So how did it get that much speed? Well, the, the energy that it's using for its electrical systems and its CPUs and its instruments has nothing to do with the speed. The speed has basically got a big push by that rocket as it left the Earth. And that's pretty much all it got. Uh, when it passed Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity gave it a little bit of a fling. That sped it up so that it gets to Pluto maybe a year or two faster than it would otherwise have. Uh, but um, it's just there's nothing to stop it. Once you're in space, there's no friction. So you go fast. As long as you're launched fast, you're going to keep going fast. OK, thank you all. This has been fantastic. I think that's what you gave us is a big push. <laughs> I think we're really ready now for July. Thank you all for coming. Drive safely, and we'll see you in a month or so. <laughs>